The Cube at Hadoop Summit 2014 is brought to you by anchor sponsor Hortonworks. We do Hadoop. And headline sponsor WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. Welcome back everybody. You're watching theCUBE live here at Hadoop Summit. My next guest is John O'Brien, Principal Analyst and CEO at Radiant Advisors, and Mark Milani, who's the SVP of Product Engineering at Actian. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, John, we were talking a little bit uh, before we went on the, uh, on the air about some of the, you know, the hot topics here at Hadoop Summit, and of course, SQL on Hadoop is one of them. Yes. Um, why don't you, if you could, start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Radiant Advisors, and sure. then let's just dive into what you're seeing in terms of the SQL on Hadoop market market and, and, sure. and what you make of all the different options out there. Okay, so Radiant Advisors, we're a, uh, a research and advisory firm, so we work with a large client base here in Europe. And a lot of the tracking of uh, big data architectures, adoption strategies as companies are moving into wanting to understand implementation services and best practices, that's where we work. Mm -hmm. uh, we also do independent research and benchmarks, and we've been tracking the, uh, you know, several things from last year, definitely we saw evolving uh, you know, the, the integration aspect with BI, mm -hmm. the accessibility aspect, which we saw last year as the SQL on Hadoop was going to come up. And of course, we saw several uh, products hit the market. We've done our own independent benchmark around that for the different products that's available on our website for download for anybody. And from that, you can, uh, you know, we really tried to break down an approach from our clients' perspectives of how do we decide what's going to be a good SQL engine on Hadoop? What should we be looking for? What are the criteria for comparing them? And we just continue to see, even this week here at the Hadoop Summit, the, it just is gaining more and more momentum as a really important topic. Yeah, well, well why don't we, before we kind of start talking about the different options out there, why yeah. don't we talk about what are you seeing from uh, your clients in terms of the, the drivers of this? Why are they sure. so interested in this? Uh, so one of the main drivers, and we go to different summits all the time in think tanks with companies as well, and there's always the, we hear about the shortage of data scientists mm -hmm. or you know, MapReduce programmers. You know, we do not have enough resources yet. We have this, you know, a lot of people in the enterprise already enabled with BI, already doing a lot of SQL, and there's this large group of people we just need to enable. They already work with data, but they do it with the SQL. So it's a way of how do we solve the, you know, kind of talent and skill shortage by maybe picking up a little bit more of bringing them into the Hadoop environments, mm -hmm. right? So um, in doing that, it means introducing some schema on read and some other capabilities and new processes, but the main driver has been, uh, if you want value out of your Hadoop system, you have to open it up to the most people you know, as possible. Not just data scientist groups or specialized MapReduce mm -hmm. teams, but everybody in the company has to have the ability to go in there and work with data and pull out insights. And in order to do that, SQL has already been proven to be that de facto standard mm -hmm. for us. So how do we incorporate that into the equation? Mm -hmm. and that seems to be the main driver for us. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, I want to bring you in the conversation. So Actian this week announced their, their entry into the SQL on Hadoop market. Tell us a little bit about um, you know, the announcement uh, and kind of the drivers from your perspective uh, to, to taking this step. Yeah, so we announced uh, SQL on Hadoop solution based on our uh, formerly called VectorWise product, now Actium Vector product. Um, it, uh, I heard John talk about SQL access. The actual genesis of the project wasn't for SQL access at all. It was more on how to scale Vector itself, which has already mm -hmm. held the single node database records, and as we were looking at alternatives, HDFS mm -hmm. was an obvious alternative. What we found interesting once we got into it was, not only was it just an, a file system that we can provide easier access to, but it had a lot of new capabilities coming out with Yarn for workload management. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we do uniquely in updates, uh, are the, we call positional delta trees, are, are very unique to us and patented to us, mm -hmm. and we felt like we could work with an append file system in a way that was unique that I think it'll take a while for, for others to catch up to, and not only that, but I think, uh, uh, I think we can extend it quite a bit from where we are today. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, a bit about how it fits into the larger approach from Actian. I mean, you've, got, you've made some acquisitions, you've also got the, what was known as ParXL, uh, you've got the pervasive data, data integration component as well. Uh, where does it fit in kind of your approach to uh, big data? I mean, it sounds like you've got a really an end-to-end uh, solution set is the idea to build this platform for customers? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, we, have, uh, we have the vector database, we have the former ParXL, now we call it Actium Matrix database, mm -hmm. and we have the former pervasive data rush product, which is now called Dataflow. 
Um, all the pieces are coming together in our roadmap. Um, this is just the first part of taking vector, bringing it to HDFS. Data flow was already implemented directly on HDFS, so you mm -hmm. can do visual analytics directly on HDFS. Mm -hmm. uh, those jobs will soon be executed directly from the Actian matrix product mm -hmm. itself, so you can start seeing the integration happening. And you can rest assured the uh, different optimizers are coming together already too. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the interesting thing when I came into Actian was that it wasn't just a bunch of different databases that didn't fit together. There were a mm -hmm. lot of interface layers, so as an engineer it became a lot of opportunity for us. So mm -hmm. these are really nice complementary pieces. As the roadmap rolls out, there'll be HDFS, mm -hmm. vector, you'll see optimizers come together. Mm -hmm. You'll see UDF frameworks that execute our, through our mm -hmm. data flow framework. And then the platform really starts taking shape as, as we progress through the next mm -hmm. year. Yeah. So John, you mentioned you've done some benchmarks, so let's, yep. let's dig into some of that data. What, what did you find, I mean, in terms um, of uh, all the different options out there and how they perform? So, uh, the performance numbers were a little bit more as expected, but we had you know, so many independent runs that we were doing on three different clusters. Um, I think one of the things we would say is that in our approach, rather than just run a bunch of uh, you know, queries, mm -hmm. different workloads, reporting workloads, analytic workloads, uh, ad hoc workloads, rather than doing that, we actually wanted to frame it in a way where we told you know, the readers that if you're going to approach this, it's not only about performance. right? Just because yeah. they're the fastest response time doesn't mean that's always the best answer. So we kind of came up with a criteria of about three different areas. One was speed, so speed always matters. Um, but the second one also became the SQL capability, because the different engines themselves, right, when we talk about a SQL capability coming into the NoSQL space, some are SQL 92, some are SQL 99, some have anal you know, analytic functions in their roadmap, and they're putting them in as needed by customers one at a time. Um, some are leveraging the UDF, UDFs the same way. And then the, the third component was really around scalability. You know, not all of these engines run across the entire cluster. If you've got some pretty large clusters, you know, do all the engines, at least the one you're interested in, actually run on the entire cluster, or is it just a subset? Mm -hmm. So we also see you know, some architecture patterns at companies where they may have a, a couple hundred node cluster of Hadoop running, but they might carve out some smaller areas for structured data. Mm -hmm. And those you know, parameters limit the scale. If you have, you know, for example, if you have a, a large load across a, a, in a big cluster of SQL, is it more important that you run across all the thousand nodes, or is it more important that you have the SQL capabilities you know you need, mm -hmm. right? And that's some part of the comparison. Right. Now, I think what we found uh, interesting in the report, and we've been talking about as well, is that uh, we ran the SQL engines. We ran Hive 11, Hive 12. Mm -hmm. We ran Presto 57, we ran Impala, and we also ran InfinityB there. And we looked at those SQL engines on both Hadoop 1.3, Hadoop 2.0, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Cloudera Beta 5. But what was the biggest influencer of performance on those was actually the data file formats you loaded your data into. Mm -hmm. So if you were looking at ORC files or RC files or the Parquet files or InfinityB's IDB files, what we found was columnar formats, compression, all of that had a huge influence on how that engine performed. Mm -hmm. So the same engine of you know, either Hive or Presto on two different file formats would almost flip their performance in some cases. Mm -hmm. so, Really, you know, if you drop in Presto on your cluster and you're taking a look at how it works, you might be going, well, I'm not getting the performance I expected. You have to come back down and pay a lot of attention to the data file formats. Well, that's interesting because there are so many options out there yes. right now. Um, and the question, so the question is, are they all competing or, or will, we, will some find a, a niche? And will they kind of, uh, will we see uh, some consolidation, some will win, some will lose, or will they all have a place depending on kind of the particular use case? Um, I think that they're all going to have a place. Uh, what we found is that they, you know, from the text all the way down to the really columnar ones, mm -hmm. um, it's a spectrum. And the spectrum will give you increased compression, increased performance, but as you move towards more performance, you're also giving it more flexibility. Because mm -hmm. you're organizing in columns and access paths and SQL and how you want to hit it. So if you know your workload, and if it's operational SQL-based reporting, you're going to offload some data in there, then you might want to do something that's more columnar. But if it is more, you know, doing discovery and data science types, algorithms and things, you might want more flexibility and something more open. So I, I think they're all going to coexist and the users really need to know and manage where do I have which ones and for what reason. There shouldn't be just a, a we do this one file format standard. Right, so right tool for the right job kind of, yeah. kind of yeah. approach. Uh, so Mark, talk a little bit about future roadmaps to the extent that you can. Um, and I'm also curious about you know, how this impact, how you see the SQL on Hadoop 
uh, movement or trend, if you will, impacting the more traditional data warehouse world. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about complementing, Hadoop will complement the data warehouse, and I, I think we can all agree it's not going to replace it, but there are some overlaps happening, and certainly when you start adding SQL capabilities. What's your take on how that's going to, how those two industries are going to, are they going to butt up against each other? Is it going to remain complementary? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, I think it's going to depend on use case. I think it's going to depend on your business case and, mm -hmm. and what, kind of, what kind of infrastructure you want, what kind of outcome you want. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe it's going to be complementary. I don't think there's, uh, I, I think you can run your warehouse in a Hadoop cluster using SQL. I think you can run your warehouse in a, tra in a traditional LTP system. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, a lot depends on how structure your data, how unstructure your data. Uh, whether you're going to move your data, whether you're going to transform your data, whether you're going to check the quality of your data, right. mm -hmm. and how you want to do that and what's the most effective way to do it. I think there's some interesting things in just volume of data that will lend itself to uh, Hadoop file systems and, and things that, it, that can scale at that level, and I think that's why, why we're having such a, a big turnout at this conference here and other conferences, is just simply the, the volume of data is creating some interesting technical issues. And so I think what's going to happen is some of the things you've seen in data warehouse, traditional data warehouses start moving into, the, into kind of HDFS file systems, if you will. I think the key to it, though, is the simplification of access, simplification of being able to, to work with the data, mm -hmm. um, more so than just being a repository for data. Right. I think those, those layers are being built by a number of people, including ourselves. I think SQL gives you that ease of access, so it's not a map reduce algorithm to get at all of that, where you need parallel programming uh, understanding to do it. So I think that will be a huge enabler moving forward for, for HDFS warehouses, if you will. Mm -hmm. So if we could talk a little bit about actual kind of use cases when you're, when you're seeing among your clients. I mean, just the announcement was just today, but I suspect you've got some customers in beta that you've been working with. What are some of the real use cases, uh, at least the early use cases, that they're going to leverage uh, your SQL on Hadoop capabilities for? Yeah, no, traditionally, uh, the traditional uh, use case is uh, data lake, mm -hmm. ETL, and if you need to do low latency analytics, MPP, some sort of fast analytic database. And I still, a lot of the customers I talk to still do that. Um, and we talk a lot about our data flow product that can parallelize through that, mm -hmm. through that kind of ecosystem and I think that's, uh, that's going to be a very popular ecosystem. But for SQL on Hadoop and, and what we're seeing is what, what they ask me is they say, okay, well, um, yeah, I've got that. I have security constraints. I have all these things. I'm not opening up my Hadoop system to the world, particularly in financial services or healthcare. But I have uh, super users, I have uh, high value analytics I need to run. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason to set up another cluster for that. Mm -hmm. The outcome for the business is valuable enough that they might consider that. But uh, at that level they say they have super users, they want to get directly at the data, they can trust them or they can ring fence the data in a way that those users can get to it safely. And, uh, and then they can provide better service and more efficient service for it. They don't have to Okay, I need I need to run I need my quants to run something against uh, <laughs> against this data. Let's go put up a whole nother cluster. Mm -hmm. Let's put up all the security, all the administration, all the management. Uh, they just say that's exorbitantly expensive, and so this is where I think I'm seeing a lot of interest right now is where they can open up a window into that uh, into that system for the super user or for the high value set of users where there's some trusted connection that they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they can give access to. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of uh, Actian's uh, interaction with the community, can you talk a little bit about kind of, um, you know, are you contributing to certain projects? What's the, what's the uh, level of commitment uh, and contributions, I should say, uh, and activity with this larger community behind us? Um, in terms yeah, of what's Actian's approach to that? Yeah, we're working with, uh, we're working with partners like Hortonworks, particularly around Yarn, that's super important to us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how much we contribute still, we've been so focused on this solution, we haven't gotten to the part of contribution, but mm -hmm. um, Yarn's going to be incredibly important to a system that can use as much as the CPU as it can. Mm -hmm. So one of the things around Actium Vector is, and anybody that saw Peter Bonds maybe in one of these earlier discussions, uses all the cores, uses as much as they can, and can get as much through as they need. Well, uh, workload management this is not a new story in computer science, right? This is, workload management becomes a much more critical thing. So yeah. I see a lot of our involvement in the YARN community at some mm -hmm. point in the future. Right now it's just 
merely getting it enabled and certified, mm -hmm. and we work with various vendors here to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, talk a little bit about uh, kind of how you see this evolving. I mean, we, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, as we talked about, competing approaches to this. Sure. Um, and Yarn opens up a whole, whole right. slew of different types of processing right. that can take place now on, on Hadoop. Yarn's, uh, you know, a big breakthrough, but it's still pretty early, it seems, yes. in terms of, you know, actually seeing some production workloads out there. Yes. What are you seeing, and how do you see uh, Yarn impacting the development of Hadoop going forward? Um, I think it's really significant. So a lot of our uh, framework that we deliver is really a three-tiered kind of architecture with Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And one of the things with Hadoop that is so valuable with the SQL side, of course, is the flexibility, um, scalability. But we still have an analytic tier, you know, because that's a specialized workload with mm -hmm. different databases. And the enterprise warehouses and the MDM still live in a very structured reference data piece. So when you start with that today, and you, know, you have Hadoop out there gaining adoption, and then you look at Hadoop 2, over time, and we're looking at five, 10, and 15 years out, I think it's really um, clear, and we advise most of the companies we work with to say, look, the Hadoop 2, if you're not adopting it today, you will be. It's a great data operating system platform. We've studied you know, uh, major like, you know, data architectures and service-oriented architectures for decades. And this is part of that whole natural evolution, really, mm -hmm. right? The persistence layer separated from the operating system layer, which is what Yarn is, you want to be on that. And so when you have the SQL engines coming out today, one of the things, or any of the other components, we advise you know, companies on is to say, you want to make sure they have a Yarn story. Mm -hmm. Because even if you're not there today, you're going to be there. That's the direction, without a doubt. And you want to bring things within your ecosystem that all work together. Mm -hmm. and, and the SQL on, uh, engines are no different. Uh, they need to be at least in Yarn today or Yarn compatible or have it in their roadmap within this year mm -hmm. uh, in order to you know, keep pace. Because it is a really fast moving environment. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. This is where we're saying the data warehouses aren't going away. Mm -hmm. The MDMs, the analytic MPPs and the columnars. But as you identify workloads and you maximize your overall architecture, you know, that's where Hadoop plays a big, bigger and bigger role over time. So, uh, you know, we, you know, Hadoop, of course, with the yarn is a newer thing. It takes time for adoption on this stuff, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's not a, a passing thing at all. I think it's a very, very significant stride in data architectures. Absolutely. Uh, so tell our listeners out there where they can go and, and find some of the benchmarks you mentioned earlier. Sure, um, radiantadvisors.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on our homepage, just download the ebook. Uh, has all the benchmark summaries, the uh, approaches and numbers, take a look at that. And definitely give us your feedback. Uh, we're getting ready to do our second benchmark because more engines have come out in the last six months. Mm -hmm. This was from January of this year. Uh, newer versions like uh, Hive 13 with Tez as well, uh, Acteon's engine we want to include. So we're looking for feedback on what you like or how should we do it differently and, and make a, another meaningful benchmark for the industry that's independent and everybody can turn to, with a little bit of thought and framework around it as well, not just speeds and numbers. Right, uh, so Mark, I'm going to give you the last word. You know, for our audience out there that are practitioners, that they're trying to wrap their heads around this, um, this world of Hadoop and, and some of the new capabilities, what advice would you have for, for practitioners out there that are looking to get started, maybe they're in the traditional world. Um, as John said, there's no time to wait, you kind of have to get moving. Uh, what advice would you have, uh, you know, one or two key pieces of advice for those practitioners? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, I think the SQL on Hadoop thing is going to help people quite a bit. I mean, um, I would encourage people uh, at the end of the month when it's available, download it. Even before then, I would download Vector ahead of that. I mean, you can start your Hadoop applications. Now that we've gotten into uh, databases uh, where Hadoop is an integral part of the infrastructure, it doesn't really matter whether it's one running on Hadoop or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think the, the SQL on Hadoop thing is not going away. There's a reason there's there's a big interest in it, mm -hmm. and it provides access. It opens up the world to developers in NoSQL, and, right. and there's quite a few of those out there. <laughs> there certainly are. All right, John O'Brien, Mark Milani, thank you guys so much thank for joining you. us on theCUBE. I uh, would we'll love to have you back at, uh, at a future event. You're watching theCUBE at Hadoop Summit 2014. Uh, stay tuned, we'll be right back with our next guest.